Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. Anybody want to get into the Word of the Lord today? All right. Praise God. Let's do it. Stand to your feet if you have the ability. I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord together in prayer. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're grateful that we get to come into your house openly and freely, God. What a privilege. What an honor, God. Good to be in your presence. Lord, we pray today that as we open up your word, God, that you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, we fully recognize and acknowledge that we didn't come today to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine. We came to hear from the true teacher of the church, who is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. Come and be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the instruction, the direction, even the correction we need for our lives. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor. And God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, that are preaching and hearing your gospel this day. We bless them, Lord. There are brothers and sisters. At no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else. We see ourselves as co-workers and laborers together, building your kingdom, God. So we ask that you would bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. God, we thank you for Calvary Chapel, God. We bless the assemblies in the four squares, God, for victory outreach, Lord, for our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters. Lord, if they're naming Jesus as Lord, preaching his gospel, we bless them this day as you'd bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, we said? Amen. Amen. Man, you can have a seat. I'd like to welcome those of you that are joining us on the live stream across the nation and around the world. I believe God's going to speak to you wherever you're at, too. Today we're starting a new series called Why Church. This is part number one. The teaching team is going to be rotating through and talking about why church. But I thought it'd be kind of fun before we got into today's message to, to have a little fun and, and, and kind of laugh a little bit. You know, sometimes things can happen. It's, even in church, you know, stuff can happen. And, and, uh, and, and you know, and we understand this from, from the, the cell phone. Everybody got a cell phone. You've been texting. And, and you try and say, like, hey, I'm coming over to pick up the kids. And it switches over to I'm coming over to beat up the kids, you know. <laughs> Typos can happen, you know, that, that stupid autocorrect stuff happens. And, and so we, we, we were looking at this, and we found some stuff in church bulletins, okay, some little typos. This was before, you know, really they, they had the autocorrect and, and grammatical thing, you know, and sometimes stuff sneaks in there. Now, not in our bulletins. If you find one in our bulletin, hey, you win the prize. Maybe next week we'll read you one from our, our church bulletin. They found one, so you, you can all be looking at that later on, not during the sermon, please. But uh, anyways, found in the church bulletin. This is just some fun stuff. Here's the first one. And we'll put it up on the overhead so you can follow along too. Found in the church bulletin. First one, ushers will eat latecomers. <laughs> See, our, our ushers greet latecomers, but a different type of church, I guess. Here's one found in the church bulletin. The third verse of Blessed Assurance will be sung without musical accomplishment. <laughs> Scouts are saving aluminum cans, bottles, and other items to be recycled. Proceeds will be used to cripple children. Yikes. Found in the church bulletin, I like this one. The choir will meet at the Larson House for fun and sinning. <laughs> Could happen. How about this one? Miss Charlene Mason sang, I will not pass this way again, giving obvious pleasure to the congregation. <laughs> Here's one for all, the, for all the wives in the place. Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a good chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Bring your husbands. <laughs> What's the clap for? I mean, come on now. Wasn't that good? Uh, I like this one. Found in the church bulletin. Next Sunday is the family hayride and bonfire at the Fowlers. Bring your own hot dogs and guns. Friends are welcome. Everyone come for a fun time. <laughs> Hot dogs and guns. All right. Here's a good one. Smile at someone who is hard to love. Say hell to someone who doesn't care much about you. <laughs> Hello. Here's a good one. You've got to pay attention to this one, okay? The peacemaking meeting scheduled for today has been canceled due to a conflict. <laughs> Isn't that great? Oh, this, this is probably one of my favorite ones. The sermon this morning, Jesus walks on the water. The sermon tonight, searching for Jesus. <laughs> I love it. I love it. 
Next Thursday, there will be tryouts for the choir. They need all the help they can get. <laughs> Not our choir. Our choir is great. Amen. Uh, like this one, Barbara, Barbara is our, our chief financial officer here. This one's for you, Barbara. The agenda was adopted. The minutes were approved. The financial secretary gave a grief report. <laughs> Th thought you'd like that one. Uh, Barbara C. remains in the hospital and needs blood donors for more transfusions. She's also having trouble sleeping and requests tapes of Pastor Jack's sermons. <laughs> you ever wondered why we preach like we do here at this church? Veins popping out, spitting and sweating. That's why. Uh, the over 60 squire will be disbanded for the summer with thanks of the entire church. <laughs> okay, I got to set this one up, okay? There's a missionary from Africa speaking at a church. Her name is kind of an unusual name, Bertha Belch, okay? Here's the announcement in the church bulletin, found in the church bulletin. Come tonight and hear Bertha Belch all the way from Africa. <laughs> I wish I could download the visual image of that in my head onto the screens for you guys. It was great. Okay, again, you got to pay attention to this one. Found in the church bulletin. Cost for attending the fasting and prayer conference includes meals. <laughs> includes meals. Fasting. Some of you guys will get that tomorrow. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Last one. Topic for our sermon next week. What is hell? Come early and listen to our choir practice. <laughs> That's it for today. Found in the church bulletin. Maybe we'll bring some more out next week. Today I want to talk to you about a subject called Why Church. Hebrews the 10th chapter. We're going line upon line, precept upon precept in Hebrews the 10th chapter. We believe that God wrote it that way. We ought to be able to understand it that way. And in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, we've been learning that we can enter into the presence of God. We can go right in. We've been given access by the blood of Jesus. We live a life of faith. Last time we talked about that God is faithful. And also our response of that revelation should be that we are in turn are faithful, faith-filled, as well as faith-focused people of God. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, goes on in verse number 24, verse number 25. Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 24, and verse number 25 says this says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things about these verses. First of all is that the word the day, the day approaching. That word day is capitalized. That's really speaking of the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that because Jesus is coming back for his people, because Jesus is returning, the earth will be devoured with the, the fire and the elements will all burn up. It's a very serious thing for us, and so we need to pay attention. We need to get focused. We need to recognize the times and see what it is that we need to do. And so as we see the day approaching, we need to start to consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. Now, the language of verse number 25 expresses the desire of verse number 24. What do I mean by that? If you take a look at the language, the words that are used in verse number 25, really those words are strategic words that have been placed there by the Holy Spirit to point out this is the, the, the desire of the previous verse. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as is the manner of some. Why? Because we need to consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. You can't do that if you're not in church. Now, that word forsaking is an interesting word. Sometimes we think about forsaking like I just left it, and, and I left it alone, you know, whatever it may be. We think about maybe you forsook your car out there in the parking lot for a while, or, you know, you forsook your home when you left. Really, that word forsaking is not talking about things or objects. That word forsaking is talking about people. What it really means is to desert someone or to leave them helpless. That's why Jesus cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, he was, he was left there on the cross to bear the sin of the world. Or how about this? The Apostle Paul writing, and he says, all have forsaken me. Only Timothy is left. See, he, he had been abandoned. He had been left alone. Really, that's why it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Don't leave the church destitute and alone. Don't desert the church or leave the church helpless. The word assembling is also a great word. It comes from the same root word that we find for synagogue, 
right? Which we know a synagogue is, is the place where the local Jewish people gathered together. And they would gather together for a purpose, gather together to hear the word of the Lord, gather together for fellowship, community, and unity. So the question lingers, even with these verses, that's great, that's, that's fine, but the question lingers, why? Why church? Why is it so important that Christians actually gather together in one place? Can't we just get saved, read our Bibles, pray, listen to a sermon online? Can't we just, you know, maybe watch the live stream if we don't feel like it? You know, why is it so important that we actually get into an assembled gathering place called church? Can't you just, just do your thing and, and give your heart to the Lord and still be a Christian on your own? Well, the, the simple answer to that is yes. I, I, I guess you could still be a Christian on your own, reading your Bible, praying, hearing from the Lord, worshiping God on your own, listening to CDs and that sort of a thing, and, and that's good enough, you know? I, I, I kind of wonder if you'll be able to endure to the end with that, though. Because as I look through the scriptures, I find out that God desires people to be in church, and God has a plan for church, and God is interested in the church, and God is focusing on the church, and with all that God says about church in the Word of God, I really do wonder if we could do things on our own. I, I, I really don't think so, and I'll show that to you today in the Scriptures. See, you can be a Christian who's saved, but you'll miss out on the purpose and plan of God for your life. That's a pretty bold statement, but I'm going to back that up today with Scripture. But first, I want to make a statement to you. Why church? Here's, here's probably the simplest answer, the easiest answer is this. Why church? Well, because church is God's idea. Not my idea. I didn't dream up church, and therefore we're, we're all gathered here today, and you guys are just submitted to my will. It wasn't Pastor Jim and Pastor Deborah who started the church 26 years ago with 12 people and a box of cleanings. That wasn't their idea. Church is God's idea. When God took a look at the plan of the ages and what he wanted to do on the earth, when, when God took a look at Jesus going to the cross, he envisioned a church. God wanted to see a church. God was died for the church. God is interested in the church. This is God's idea. Now, remember, I said I'm going to back this up with Scripture today. Turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 16. Matthew, chapter 16. In fact, this is one of the foundational Scriptures of the Rock Church, where we derive our name from, and you'll see that. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Matthew chapter 16, let me set the stage for you. Jesus is traveling with his disciples. He's speaking to them. And he says, you guys have been out on the street. I'm paraphrasing now. You guys have been out on the street hearing what people are talking about. Who do the people say that I am? Disciples respond. They say, well, you know, some people say you're John the Baptist. Some people say Elijah. Some people say the prophet. You know, a lot of stuff being said about you. Jesus turned this question around on them and says, okay, that's cool. But who do you say that I am? Now, the spokesman, the big mouth, loud mouth, Peter, I love this guy. Peter just oftentimes just steps up to the plate and he goes for it. And Peter says, well, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, I want you to look at Matthew, the 16th chapter, verse number 17. Look at Jesus' response to what Peter just said. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 17. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon, bar Jonah, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. In other words, Peter, you thought that you were just saying what you thought. But really, you had a revelation from Almighty God, and now you declared me to be Jesus as Lord, and that's a blessing in your life. Now, look at what he goes on to say. And also, verse 18, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So he changes Simon's name to Peter, Petra, meaning rock. Now, many people believe that because Jesus said this to Peter upon this rock, that, that really Peter was the foundation of the church and, 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 and God built the church on Peter's back. But, but in the natural, I guess you could say, yeah, you know, we can see that Peter was a leader in the church on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church. Here's Peter preaching the first sermon. People are getting saved. They're building the church, the early church there. He was one of the pillars, yes. But the foundation, really, that rock, if you look in Scripture, is not Peter. That foundation and that rock is Jesus Christ. The Bible calls him the chief cornerstone. He is, he is the one that is laid. He is the foundational stone that all of the other stones that are being built up into the spiritual house of God, that's us, right? As we get born again, God places us into his spiritual house that's being built. And now we line up with that foundational cornerstone, Jesus Christ. He is the foundation of our lives. Also, you'll find the Apostle Paul saying there is no other foundation that can be laid except that which is already laid. And that foundation is Jesus Christ. 
So when we look at this, remember, this is not our idea. This is not a man's idea. This is not an institution of man set up, but rather this is the church of the Almighty God. And upon this rock, upon the confession of who Jesus is as Lord, as Messiah, that upon that confession, Jesus says, I will build my church. This is God's idea. He goes on in verse number 19, he says this, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, that word that Jesus uses for church, that word is ecclesia, ecclesia. Now, this in secular Greek terminology, was used of an assembly, right? Like, uh, you can find that even in the Bible where you find, like, the, the mob at Ephesus gathered together. There was a bunch of people that assembled together. That was called the Ecclesia. Also, if you, you read the Septuagint, that was the Greek Old Testament version, right? The Old Testament translated into Greek. You'll find this word Ecclesia used for the gathered uh, nation of Israel that came together. That was the Ecclesia. It was an assembly. We understand this in our present day terminology when we talk about things like the state assembly, right? These are the lawmakers, the decision makers, right? The leaders, they are coming together, they assemble, and they make decisions for our state. So when we take a look at the church, Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church, my Ecclesia. The gathered saints of God who have confessed Jesus as Lord. Now I will build my church, my ecclesia. I will gather them together and, and whatever they bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever they loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Why? Because they have the king, keys. What are the keys? The keys is the authority. Now we have the power and the authority to lock and to unlock as the church. See, as we gather together, much like the state assembly, we gather together and we hear the heartbeat and the word of the Lord. And now we are, like that state assembly, we are as the church, the ecclesia, the gathered saints of God. We are the ruling, reigning monarchy here on the earth now. The devil no longer has the authority, but the church has the authority. Jesus has given us the keys. And now whatever we bind on our seat, we can see things that are going on on the earth. And as a church, we can see those things and we can say, devil, I bind you in the name of Jesus. Why? Because now the church is making the decision. I'm not going to allow that to go on any longer. That thing is bound. It is no longer powerful. And what does the Bible says? Whatever door God closes, no man can open. They may try. They may not. They may kick at it. But they're not going to open it. Why? Because God Almighty has closed it through the hand of his church. And whatever you loose on earth, shall also be loosed in heaven. What does that mean? See, we can release our faith, believe God for great and mighty things, do the miraculous, see signs, wonders, miracles, gifts of the Holy Ghost poured out in and through the church in confirmation to his word. Why? Because we release the word. We release faith. We are releasing the captives and we preach the gospel now. Those that are bound, those that are locked up, those that are in sin now, we can preach freedom to them and we can preach it in Jesus' name and now we can release them from that bondage. We've been given authority here on the earth. And how dare we come against the church of Almighty God? How dare we speak against that which Jesus died for and is precious to him, that he himself is building? How dare we scatter where he is gathered? See, this is God's church. It's not my church. Not the pastor's. This is Jesus' church. He is the head, and we are the body. We are all servants to him. We are all connected to him. He is the head. See, that's why there's structure. That's why there's organization in the church. You'll find even, the, the, there's only two times that you find Jesus talking about the Ecclesia. One right here in Matthew 16, and then another time in Matthew 18, where he's talking about church discipline, church structure. He said, if your brother offends you, go and tell it to him. If he won't hear you, take two or three witnesses along with you. Speak to him. If he still won't hear them, take it to the church, the Ecclesia, the gathered, assembled saints of God. If he won't hear the church, then, then discipline him. Cast him out of the assembly. We see this in the, in the book of 1 Corinthians. The apostle Paul said there was a brother that was singing. He said, cast him out to the destruction of the flesh so he'll learn not to blaspheme. Now, then you read in 2 Corinthians, he said, let him back in, guys. He's repented. Okay, come on now. Don't be so harsh. Let, okay, let him back in now. All right? But what was going on? There was a structure. There was an organization. See, sometimes we think that if there's organization in the church, something's got to be wrong because now uh, it's, not, it's not woo-woo and Holy Ghost and all that. And, and, you know, you didn't get the goosebumps and uh, people weren't jumping up on one side and speaking this and somebody over on the other side and, and chaotic and all that because that's got to be God, right? No, God is a God of order, the Bible says. God is not a God of chaos and confusion and division. No, God is a God of order. That's why there's structure. That's why you read in 1 Corinthians 14. If you somebody's going to prophesy, let the first person that was talking be quiet first. Then let them go and prophesy. This is, this is, this is unity. This is not division. This is order in the church. 
had some people come and say, you know, I, 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 you know, one guy came through and I had seen him come to the church for a while and, uh, you know, knew of him and so I was talking to him. I said, where you been at, man? You haven't been around church for a while. Oh, well, you know, I go to all the churches. And I said, well, you know, the Bible says those that are planted, and you got to get planted, you know, there's a home base, you know. Even the Apostle Paul, every time he went out, he came back to Antioch. That was like home base, you know. That was where he was separated for the work and sent out from. There's the local body of Christ. That's God's plan. We, we assemble. We gather together. So you're just hopping around? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, I'm not really submitted to any past pastors. They're low. You know, I, I, I got people that are apostles, and, and we're doing the real work. You know, we're out there till 2, 3 a.m. in the morning doing covert ops for Jesus. And I'm like, really? Yeah, we're like the black ops. I can't tell you what we're doing. 2, 3 a.m. in the night, huh? My Bible says that bad stuff goes on at night. People get drunk, they get drunk at night. And don't you have a wife and a child at home? You're leaving your family in the middle of the night? You think that's the will of God? Oh, well, <laughs> and he bounced out of this place. Why? Because I jammed him up. See, we can't forsake that which Jesus is building. There's order, there's structure, there's discipline. Sometimes people say, well, okay, well, I, I understand that, but you know, uh, that's not the, the church of the New Testament. That's not the church of the book of Acts. They were just flowing with the Holy Ghost. They were just going from house to house, and it just was happening. You know, there wasn't really pastors. There was a bunch of people. Yeah, and I understand that. And all. No, Ephesians 4 chapter says, God gave gifts unto men, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. There's structure in the church. There is authority in the church. And guess what? Even in the book of Acts, you'll find that same structure in the house churches. Let me show it to you. Let me show it to you. Turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. You're there in Matthew. Remember where Matthew's at. We'll, we'll come back there in a minute. But Acts chapter 2. In the book of Acts chapter 2, verse number 41, starting out. I want you to notice that we are not in Acts chapter 16. We are not in Acts chapter 20. We are in Acts chapter 2. This is the same chapter that the Holy Ghost is poured out on the day of Pentecost. The same chapter where they run out to the streets. They're speaking in other tongues. And people are getting saved because they hear the wonderful works of God in their own language. They're coming. They've all drawn together. Peter preaches his famous sermon. Now look at what happens. It's right off the bat. Birth of the church. Right at the beginning, was it chaotic? Was it just everywhere? Was there no structure or no authority? Ah, let's take a look. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse number 41, reading through verse number 42. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Now stop right there, look up on the overheads. I want you to notice in the church, people who gladly received Peter's word were baptized. So baptism is one of the things that happens at church. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. There was an altar call that was given, and people responded to that altar call, giving God all their heart and all their life. They were born again. Look at verse number 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, again, up on the overheads, I've highlighted some words. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' Doctrine. What is doctrine? That is a system of teaching so that we can understand about God and about his word. That does not happen without structure. That doesn't happen without somebody studying the word of the Lord and putting together some sort of a form of teaching where they get a hold of the counsel of God. This is the will of God. This is what the word of God has to say. This is how we understand it because this, because that, because this, because that. And it's a structured, disciplined teaching of the word of the Lord. That is doctrine. It's a system of teaching. And it was consistent. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship. Koinonia, people getting together, having fellowship. They had godly relationships. How about this? In the breaking of bread. Not only eating food, but I also believe in receiving communion together, the Lord's Supper. They broke the bread. They received the cup, right? The new covenant. They were breaking bread. That's something that we do at churches, have communion. Also this, and in prayers. See, the ecclesia, the gathered saints of God to get, got together, they bound and they loosed through their prayers. That happens in church. Drop down to verse Number 46, what else happened? So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Now stop right there for a second. Did they only meet in the house? It's okay to answer today. Did they only meet in the house? No, with one accord where? In the temple. That was a structure that was a building that was a gathering place for them. Remember, these were Jewish people. 
They were Jews before they were Christians. And the Jewish people gathered together at the temple. They had the hour of prayer. They had times that they needed to go there. And so they continued to live their life. But the church, collectively, the people who believed in Jesus, gathered together with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. So they not only had their gathering time at one place, one structure, but also they went from house to house. See, it does not matter if church meets in a building like this one that we have. We're very blessed to have this building, very appreciative, or if it meets in an industrial complex like we used to, or if it meets in a school building, or if it meets in a home, or if it meets on the beach or in a park. What matters is that the saints of God are gathered together, assembled in one place. Next verse, verse number 47. Take a look at it. Verse number 47 says this. It says, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now, again, up on the overhead. Look at, look at this. Things that happen in church. Praising God. That's why we get together and we sing songs. You ever wonder why we sing songs before we get started in the word? Here's why. Because that's part of what the church does. We gather together. God inhabits the praises of his people. We're welcoming and inviting the spirit of God and the corporate blessing of being in the presence of God together. Praising God with one voice. Having favor with all the people. There was good works that went out. There was a witness and a testimony. That's why this church does good works, because we've got a rep here in San Bernardino and in the Inland Empire, as well as around the world, because we are the people of God. We are the church, and when people see the church being the church, now all of a sudden you have favor with all the people. People start to step up and take notice and say, you know, I like what you're doing. They may not be Christians. They may not want to be Christians, but if you're doing the will and the way of the Lord, people are going to stand up and take notice and say, I appreciate that. I respect that. See, that's what happened with them. And look at this. And the Lord added to the church. The Lord added to the church. The Lord added to the church, the ecclesia, the gathered together saints of Almighty God, both in the temple and at the house, daily those who were being saved. There's an altar call. There's people getting saved. See, that's why at every church service that we have, we give an altar call. We give a time for people to respond, giving their hearts and lives to Jesus, because that's what we do in church. Now, not only is church God's idea. See, this was God's idea. That's, you see the structure right there in the book of Acts. Right as the church is birthed, there's a structure, there's authority, there's things that are taking place. But also, not only is church God's idea, why church? Well, here's why. Because church is God's plan. Maybe you never thought about it this way, but there is no plan B. We're it. Jesus Christ left, he gave us his spirit, and now you and I, the gathered assembly, the church of Almighty God, we are the plan of God for the world. Let me show it to you in the word, Ephesians, the first chapter. You can turn there if you want to. I'm going to read it to you, though, in the message paraf paraphrase, okay? Now, we study from the old King James Version, the most reliable version that you see. We preach and teach from the new King James Version. It takes all the these and thous and that sort of a thing uh, out, and so it's a little bit easier to understand in our modern-day contemporary English but I'm going to read this to you in the message paraphrase because it, it draws a sort of a different picture, gets, a, gets us a better understanding, I believe, for what we're talking about today of what is taking place. Ephesians 1st chapter, verse number 22, 23 in the message paraphrase. I'll put it up on the overheads for you. Here's what it says. It says this. He's in charge of it all, has the final word on everything. At the center of all this, Christ rules the church. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. The church is Christ's body, which he speaks and acts, by which he fills everything with his presence. Now, I want you to notice, church is not an afterthought. Church is not just a good idea that God had, and it's cool, and therefore we do it just because it's kind of fun, and, you know, we, we like it. No, church is the plan of God. See, we think about God, and we think about Jesus, and here he is in heaven, and he's ruling the universe, holding everything together by the power of his word. Does he really have time to be interested in what's going on here on the earth? Well, he does. We get a picture in the book of Revelation of Jesus tending to the flame, tending, trimming the wick of the candle of his church, pouring oil in and making sure that that flame stays lit. See, Jesus is intimately involved in the church. When he focuses on what's going on on the earth, he's not looking around at world events. He's looking at his church. That's why it says the church is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. See, the church is not on the side. Church is not out of focus. Church is not over here. And, and, and really, God's just interested in the world. No, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever should believe shall not perish but have everlasting life. But now that Jesus has gone to the cross and died and opened up the way, now what is he interested in? He is interested in his church. The world is peripheral to the church. See, if the church is doing their job, the world will come in and get saved. 
church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts, by which he fills everything with his presence. Very important that we understand this. See, in connection with church structure, Matthew, the 18th chapter, you remember we were talking about that? Turn with me back to Matthew, the 18th chapter. Matthew, the 18th chapter, present day, talking about what Jesus is doing in his church today. It's God's idea, but it's also God's plan. Matthew, chapter 18, verse number 20, says this. He says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. See, wherever people are gathering, it doesn't matter how big, how small. Sometimes people get mad at big churches. Listen, Jesus is here in the big church. Sometimes people look down on the small church. No, Jesus is there in the church. Church has been around a long time, you know, lasted a lot of years. There are churches that are celebrating 100-year anniversaries in our area. Jesus is in the midst of his church. Churches that just started this past week. Jesus is there in the midst of the church. See, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, in the church building, in the school building, in the house, down there on the beach, if they're having church and they're gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Jesus is in the midst of his church. Which brings me to the final thought for today. Why church? Not only is it God's idea, not only is it God's plan, but individually we are Christians together. We are the church. I don't know if that excites you, but that sure excites me. Because individually we're Christians, but together, we're better together than we are apart. Together, we are the church. It's not just a building, not just a facade, not just a mask. We, the people of God, the born again, the called ones, the saved ones, gather together now. We have power. We are the church of Almighty God. John Wesley said this, the Bible knows nothing of solitary religion. See, that's why I said I don't know if you can do it by yourself because God has designed for us to be connected to one another. God wants us to live life together. Every tribe, every nation, every tongue, see, doesn't matter if you're black, white, brown, yellow, red, polka dot. See, we're all connected. We're all family now. It's one race, one tribe, one blood. We're connected by the blood of Jesus. There's not even male or female anymore. We all have partnership in the kingdom of God. Individually, we're Christians. But together, we are the church. We need each other. We're connected in Christ. See, you can even see this in the names that, that, that the Bible speaks of the church. All throughout the Bible, there's different names for the church. And especially in the New Testament, you'll find the church called different things. And in that, we see that we're connected. What is the church? The church is Christ's body. The church is Christ's bride. Church is Christ's family, Christ's army, Christ's team of athletes, Christ's flock, Christ's field, Christ's building, and Christ's house. Every term describes diversity and unity. Isn't that awesome? Every term describes diversity and unity, many put together as one. Let me read them to you once again. Think about this, diversity but unity. Christ's body, bride, family, army, team of athletes, flock, field, building, and house. Diversity, but unity. Many put together as one. Why church? Here's why. Church is God's idea. Not my idea. Not any man's idea. This is God that put this thing together. Why church? Church is God's plan. This is how God is moving on the earth today, and I want to be a part of that. And individually, we're Christians, but together, we are the church. Can you give God a great big praise? this house today. <laughs> Hallelujah. You guys have been great today. I want to talk to you guys. I want to ask no one get up, no one leave during this time, no one get up and walk around. Give me a couple more minutes of your attention, then we'll let you go. Let the ushers do their job. They're going to continue to receive that honoring of the Lord and take that out. But I want you guys just to tune everything else out right now. Tune into what the Holy Spirit is speaking to your life. It would be a tragedy if we came together in the house of God like we have today, sang songs and had such a good time laugh together, and get a hold of the Word of God. You guys were great. It would be a tragedy if we did all that, and then we allowed you to leave this place, and this was your last day on the earth. And God forbid this should happen to anybody in this place, but what if? What if today was your last day? You died. Where would you go? Would you go to heaven, or would you go to hell? Just answer that question in the heart. No one will know the answer, but you and God. Now, let's examine your answer, because it tells a lot about where you're at with God. Some of you in this place might have said this. You might have said, well, pastor, I'm not going to go to hell. I don't believe in hell. It's not real. That's a fairy tale that they tell children to scare them. 
But the problem with that thinking is you can't just ignore hell and think that it's going to go away. You can't just bury your head in the sand and think that that's going to keep you safe. Because the Bible talks about hell, Old and New Testament. Jesus himself spoke of hell. It's a very real place. And I want to make sure today that you don't end up there. Never intended for you and I. It's intended for the devil and the angels that rebelled against God. And yet we can choose with our life where we go, whether heaven or hell while we're here on the earth. Sometimes people say this, well, Pastor, I'm not going to go to hell because all roads lead to heaven. You just do your thing, I'll do my thing. You know, the, the religions out there can do whatever they want. And we'll all get to heaven, whatever you call it, somehow or another, some way or another. As long as we stay true to ourselves, coexist and be tolerant, that sort of a thing. You know, God's okay with that and he'll, he'll let us into heaven. But did you know the problem with that thinking is that nowhere in the Bible does it say just do whatever you want to do and you get to go to heaven? That's crazy. That's like saying all roads on earth lead to the moon. Not going to make it. You can drive around the earth as long as you want. You will never make it to the moon. It's one way you're going to have to get there. In the same way, what makes us think we can do whatever we want and go to heaven? You think that God created the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, carried it out in his son Jesus, beaten, bloody mess, hung on the cross. After he goes through all that, he says, yeah, whatever you want to do, just do whatever you want and, and, and I'll see you. No, he doesn't say it at all. Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means it's God's heaven. We're going to have to get there God's way. Not going to make it there your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. We've got to get there God's way. Don't you think that God, after he went to the cross and did all that, don't you think he'd let us know how to get to heaven? Well, he does in his word. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, that's good news because, you know, I know that, that God lets good people into heaven. I've been really good. Used to be bad, cleaned up my act. Now I'm good. Uh, my good really outweighs my bad, you know, so I, I, I bet God will see that. I've been working on my resume, been doing a lot of good things, giving money to charities and helping out with social justice causes and, and been nice to my neighbors and, and, and you know, God sees that. He's going to let me to heaven. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible say you can be good enough to get to heaven? Because the standard is perfection. And the only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. Not going to get to heaven just by being good. See, our goodness compared to God's goodness, the Bible describes as like filthy rags. Not going to get to stay. Going to get thrown out. Can't get to heaven just by being good. Sometimes people say, well, I understand that, but I was raised in church. My parents took me to church. Told me we were Christians growing up. They hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized a Christian as a child? You know, you, you went to religious classes like Sunday school or Sabbath school, catechism class. And you're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven, right? I mean, we're not in the other religions. We're not Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus. We're Christians. But the problem with that thinking is, did you know that nowhere in the Bible, check it out, nowhere does it say your parents raised you in church, tell your Christian that makes you Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you wear religious jewelry, attend religious classes, be baptized or Christian as a child, or be born in America, that you get to go to heaven. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Come on, if that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, let me love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough today to tell you the truth. You're, you're just simply not going to make it. So we said, well, I understand that, Pastor, but not only when I was a child did I go to church, here I am sitting in church right now. Doesn't that, doesn't that mean I'm a Christian? I'm sitting in church right now. I'm Christian. Well, you know what that's like saying? That's like saying I could go down to Dodger Stadium, wear a Dodger uniform, sit in the Dodger dugout, bring my bat and my ball, and think that I'm going to get to play in the game. You know what's going to happen? They're going to find me sitting there. They're going to drag me out and lock me up. Why? Because I am not a member of the Dodgers organization. Same way, you can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. Sometimes people say, okay, I understand that. But you don't understand. My last church, I got involved. I helped out, sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. And I taught in the Bible class. I even got a membership card to that church. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. Just, just show that to me in the Bible, can you, where your church involvement gets you into heaven? It's not there. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you help out, carry the power of the Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader. You sing in the choir, teach in the Bible classes that you get to go to heaven. It's not there. I don't see anywhere in the Bible God is waiting at the gates of heaven looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter. Come on. Let's talk about your life. Let's talk about your eternal life. Some of you might be thinking, okay, pastor, I get that. I understand that. But, but someone told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know God. I know about Jesus. Celebrate Easter every year. Sing the songs at Christmas. I could quote scriptures to you, pastor. Well, that's great. I'm glad you can do those things. But if you'd read your Bible, you know the Bible says that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. The Bible records the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth. And yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So what's going on? Everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. 
It's not about having mental assent, knowing who Jesus is in your head, and that gets you right with God, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Rather, this is about your heart. Jesus came to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. Now, let me tell you about Nicodemus. He was a good guy. Did a lot of good things. He, he wore the right clothing. He was raised up in his church called the synagogue. Parents took him there, and he eventually got involved and became one of the leaders. In fact, he held to the strictest form of the religious law. He could quote the scripture. He could sing the scripture. He could debate the scripture. I mean, how many of us could do that? And yet, when this great teacher of Israel, this person who we would have went to to find out about God, comes to Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus doesn't pat him on the back and say, Nick, man, hey, you're doing a lot of good stuff. Just keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you in heaven. He doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does he say? He says, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You must be born again. Now, right there, a lot of people turn off. They say, ugh, born again. I saw that in a movie. I read about that in a blog. I saw that in a book. It's just wacko, weirdo. I don't want to have anything to do with that. Well, listen, let's not let Hollywood movies, television, and the internet describe and define what being born again is for us. Let's let the Bible do that for us, okay? What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. All or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. In the last book of the Bible, book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to a church. Just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what's he talking about? Lukewarm, what's that? Well, it's a little in, a little out. A little up, a little down. A little token prayer every now and then. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, look out. Why do I say that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. Now today, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Jesus made this statement. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, your call, your choice. I'm going to give you this opportunity. I'm going to go like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Now, you might be thinking, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hands, I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh, you might be. Let's get over that today. Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one make that trade. Yet the devil thinks that you're that dumb that he can talk you out of it. Listen, you tell him to go take a jump in a fiery lake. You're going on with God today. Okay? Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, today, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, giving him all of your heart and all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Get ready to get your hand up, make it a right relationship with Jesus, acknowledging your need for him. In a moment. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television in the foyer or the Love Rock Cafe, or even online, wherever you're at all over the world and across the nation, God sees and God is watching. Then right afterwards, you can press the button on our homepage, respond to God, or if you see the blue button, you can click that, how to know God, right now, and someone will lead you in a prayer. I'm going to count to three for those of you that are here. Pop my hands together. Get ready to get your hands up. Let's get saved. Let's get right with God today, securing your eternal life with Jesus Christ. Here we go. One. Two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. Who else today? Five. Is there anybody else? Real quick. Come on up in this section. Five, six, seven. Thank you. God bless you. Who else today? Seven up on top. Eight. Got you up there. Thank you. On this side, nine. Thank you. Back in the family room, ten. Got you over there. Thank you. There's ten wise people. Who else today? Need to give God all of your heart. Need to give God all of your life. Got ten wise people already. Anybody else real quick? Ten, eleven. Back in that family room. Thank you. God bless you. 11. Anybody else? Come on, don't be shy. 12, 13. Got you over there. 13. We're at number 14. Come on. Number 14. Got you up there. Thank you. Over on this side, 15. Got you. God bless you. Who else today? You're saying, I I know I need to do this. Come on. Yeah, you should. Thank you up there in the family room. God bless you. Anybody else? About 15 wise people. Anybody else? 16. Got you. Waving at me. Thank you. Thank you for that. I wanted to make sure. Praise God. Come on. I didn't embarrass them. And I won't embarrass you. If you need to do this, hearts pounding out of your chest. Oh, that could be the Holy Spirit tugging at your heart saying, come on, let's go for it. If you're wondering if you should do this, 
Yeah, you should. Come on, let's go for God today. There's about 16 wise people. Number 17, come on. Let's pop it up when I'm looking in your direction. Where are you at? Let's pop it up. Come on. If that's you, you know you need to do this. Pop it up right now. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a hand for about 16 wise people. Hallelujah. God is so good. All right, all 16 of you, or number 17, you thought you got away with it. Hey, come on. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. If you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand. The moment we're all going to stand, we're all going to give a clap and a shout. Elijah's going to lead us in a song. As we do that, that's your cue to come forward. Now, listen, no one leave during this time. We're trying to get people to come forward. You're going that way. They're going to follow you that way. We don't want them to come this way, okay? So we're all going to stand, give a clap and a shout. As we do, if you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand, get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church, your Bible, purse, Get a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies today. Can't do that until we get you down here. So let's stand and welcome them. If that's you, you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand. You come right now. Come on down. Come on down. Make your way to the front right now. Jesus, I believe. From the family members, you can bring your children. Come on down. They're welcome. Right now. Just come on down. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that I You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Come on down. Jesus, I believe. Come on down. In you. Even if you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have. Come on, right now. They're still coming. Let's give them a hand. You can come too. You can come too. You're the reason that I breathe. What else if you need to come? You just come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on. From the family rooms, come on, bring those children down. They'll remember this. Come on down. Jesus, I believe. All right. Jesus. Hey, you guys up front. Put a big smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, okay? Came to give God all your heart. Came to give God all of your life, all right? It's the best decision of your entire life right there, okay? Good call. Now, I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left. See this guy in the blue shirt? This is Pastor Joel. Really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Listen, you already got past me. I'm about as weird as you're going to get today, okay? He's cool. He's going to do three things with you. I'm going to let you know what they are in advance. So you're not concerned, wondering, you know, are they going to beat me up in the back or what's going on? No. Okay, it's easy. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Okay, then he's going to give you some free literature, some free information, easy reading that'll help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Okay, then thirdly, he's going to give you a friend we have here in the church that we like to call a spiritual, personal trainer. Heard of a physical trainer at the gym? Helps you get strong, right? Helps you to encourage you to do the workout the right way. Spiritual, personal trainer will do that for you spiritually teaching you some things out of the Bible that'll help you get strong in the ways of the Lord. So you don't go back serving the devil, going back to the old ways, that you go on with God for the rest of your days. Now listen, let me make a promise to you guys, okay? Here's the promise. Give us one year of your life sitting consistently under the teaching here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center. That doctrine, that teaching, right? Get under it consistently. We have 11 church services a week, okay? Opportunities to gather. Get as many as you can, two, three. My goodness, some of you guys could get four and five if you could, okay? English, Spanish, women's, young adults, all that kind of stuff. Get into church consistently. And at the end of that year and for the rest of your life, you will look at your life and say, man, I am so blessed. I never knew it could be like this. Am I telling the truth, everybody? Take their word for it. You guys will make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord 
and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.